Where are you going to put it? On the One moment, please. Can you can you hold that, David? Let me have my one stick, David, so I can get up and down. What's that then? It's my uh, medical badge, and I have my religious uh, artifacts attached to it, my Star of David and my cross. And I put my cross there for Freddie. Well, I'm sure wherever Fred's at, they're having a laugh. I think, Freddie, yeah. that was a, an, excellent, an excellent job you did there. leave something for him that's I'll expect, meaningful to me. I will expect to hear him sing, it's a long way to <laughs> Tipperary, <laughs> you doggone. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And it is a long way to Tipperary. Yeah. That's excellent, <laughs> old mate. These two right. men are like my, right. my family. I love them so much. They are the best of yeah. the best of the best. There you go. That's it. Great. Well done. Well done. Well done indeed. Can you attach this to two? I should just leave it as it is. Yeah. Well, I presume so. Yeah. It's well, I'm just putting my chain on there so they got something to yeah. Yeah. attach it to or whatever, whether they want to do it. I'm just going to put it back down with this little thing attached to it, is all. There we go. Come on, we've got to make sure the Gene, I know you've got good intentions, but that is up to yes, our friend here, and that's what he wants putting down. So, if you wouldn't mind picking that up okay. and, and leaving it for it was with it, good intentions. That's okay. And, and I think that is for the family here. Oh. Well, it was his anyway to yes, do what he wanted, yes, not necessarily yeah, to stay there. Yeah. Just for Freddie. You put it where yeah. you want to, or if yes. you don't want to keep it, that's fine too. It's just, yes, you're right. Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, back we go.
don't want to spoil the occasion, so we'll give it a week before we send you the bill. <laughs> <laughs> Just step, buddy. Gene, could you say a few words about Fred for us? Well, I met Freddie and Roy my first trip here. I just happened to come across the bridge, and there they all were, British commandos and paratroopers. And, and uh, they're the first two veterans, along with Lynn Corley, that I really got to know well. And they're just my deep, close friends. And of course, I was very close with the other commandos and paratroopers who have since passed on. And fortunately, there's still a good amount of paratroopers, commandos, and American veterans that come back here that I still know that are still alive. Can you uh, give me a little But Roy and Freddie are special because they tie into with Major Howard, which I knew, in which I've attended the Ox and Bucks Toast. Uh, every year I was here except one when I was in charge of a group of Americans and I couldn't come over. But I've done that 19 times and two times when Major Howard was still alive and these men linked up with Major Howard along with the paratroopers like Lynn Corley. So their mission all tied in together and, uh, and it's just they're very special because being a special operations, special forces, black ops man, we especially appreciate their mission and how they did it. And commando training is very difficult, more like Delta Force or special ops training like I've been through, special mission unit. And, and to know these men has just been very special for me, Freddie and Roy, and my mother was here three times and met them. So I've even gone to England last year to see Freddie and Roy because I wasn't sure if Freddie would be here this year. And I'm glad I did. So, and, and when you went to England, you went to the Chelsea Pensioners yes, home? I stayed there four nights. Roy put me up with a room. And one year when David was not able to get a way to go to England to bring the boys over, I went to England. They put me up for a couple of nights on each end, and I brought the boys to Normandy. So, um, that was the year you introduced me to Fred and Roy. Yeah. yeah. I had the pleasure of meeting them, and uh, right. they... They touched me in a way that uh, very few people have ever touched me in my life. And to sit with them and listen to them talk and put smiles on people's faces that just pass by, um, I too consider myself very fortunate. And had it not been for you, that connection may never have been made, or more than likely not made at all. And I, I can't thank you for what you brought into my heart by meeting these two individuals who I will never forget uh, because of your ability to bring me into that special circle. I just want to ask for clarification. Uh, they were special soldiers. We did mention that they were commandos. Can you elaborate on the units that they were in during World War II? And so we know, uh, should anyone want to do some research on a particular commando unit and they want to look up Fred Walker's name, as well as Roy Candom's name, um, they could do a little history. Well, actually, Freddie Walker's picture, along with Jimmy Clinton, who used to come here, and it used to be Jimmy and Burke Beddows and Roy and Freddie. And uh, 
Freddie and Roy were number three commando. Now, when they first joined the British Army, they weren't in the commandos. Roy was almost sent over in 1940. Uh, he would have almost been in on the evacuation of Dunkirk, he, but the France fell so fast he didn't make it over. But he saw his real first action in 1940. He was guarding an airfield with a Lewis gun. Now this is Roy we're talking about at this moment. And he is credited with the anti-aircraft crew of a half a credit for an airplane. He can tell you that story. They would fly over fast every day or every other day, whatever, and he knew how to lead and he hit one of the planes and he, he did kill the pilot because when the pilot ditched, the holes were right where the cockpit was. So they both, they both were obviously in the regular British Army and they eventually went to the commando training. And Roy told me that as they would train, there'd be a phase in the commando training where they'd have another one of these marches where you really had to walk and run, walk and run. And if you didn't make it over the finish line, each, each time it would get longer and faster. And if you didn't make it, he said he saw guys cry because they knew if they didn't make it, then that, they were dropped. So you had to go through this incredibly hard training to make it through the commando training. And Roy was a natural athlete, and he was also an expert shot with his infield rifle. They had a very hard test. I don't know how true exactly if I'm right on the money, but I think it was at something like 200 meters and 10 seconds to hit the target 10 times and move the bolt, which is pretty fast, or maybe 15, I don't know. He was very good at that, and he was a Bryn gunner uh, down here on the, the road. When you come back to pick up Valerie, we'll stop and I'll show you that wall. But, just, uh, just, just to ask you while we're hot on the topic. They were under the Brigadier Lord Lovett. Peter Lawford played Lord Lovett in The Longest Day. That's who they were under. But the question is the 200 meters and to put place 10 shots. Give me that into relationship with uh, Lee Harvey Oswald when he shot President Kennedy. Well, I understand Oswald was actually only about 100 feet. Uh, From the motorcade itself? I have a man liquor Carcano and it is possible to have moved the bolt and shot at 100 feet is, is basically one-third the distance of 100 meters or 100 yards. 100 yards is, uh, uh, 100 meters is like 109 yards. And because a meter is 39 inches, basically, and a yard is 36. So, you know, it would be not f much farther than the, it'd be maybe 10 yards beyond that wall there. It's a length of a football field. And so Oswald was relatively close and, uh, but he had a scope. We're talking Roy, is, this was an iron sight test. And the British infield bolt was the fastest and it held 10 shots because it had a 10 round magazine. And, uh, and when you bring it up, bout comes back a little on its own. It's very fast. It's all, you can almost fire as fast as, semi, as a semi-automatic weapon. And uh, so he he didn't his uh, cartridge held how many bullets in that end field? Well, the magazine held ten rounds, two five-round stripper clips. They really didn't issue them extra magazines, although the magazine was a detachable. I fired it, and they'd load two five-round stripper clips in the top. And Roy told me he used to actually oil them a little bit so they'd slide faster. But on D-Day, he actually shot eight Germans. Uh, he fell asleep and... Now this uh, is Roy? Roy. And they were retreating and they didn't know he was there and he dropped eight of them. Roy has shot a German really close in Italy, about as far as from me to Valerie, where he said, hands up, and he had a Thompson. And the guy actually tried to pull his rifle off his shoulder. They were operating behind the German lines and he did a double tap and the guy went down. What Roy told me that the Thompsons were considered such special items that when they did a commando raid, that they, they would be issued just for that raid. And then when they had came back, they would turn it in. Uh, you see a lot of pictures of them with a Sten, but if they could get a hold of a, a Thompson or even a German MP40 that fired the same ammo, that's what they'd use because it, it was much better than the Sten gun. The Sten gun's ammo? And 9 they... millimeter Parabellum, 9 by 19 millimeter. 
Uh, the Soviet Makarov round is a 9 by 18 millimeter, but the 9 millimeter parabellum that the British used in the Sten gun was the same as the 9 millimeter the Germans used. Parabellum means for war. So they could pick up that ammo anytime they needed it if there was a dead German lying around who yeah, just... Well, they could take the magazines and the whole nine yards, the magazine loader, and, and of course the German magazines were basically the same size, so they could stick them in there, take the loader, and they, they were operating. Uh, Lynn Corley, who was a paratrooper, told me that they would up their firepower a lot by using the German MG42 if they could get it, because the Bren gun, even though it's called the machine gun, it loads with a box magazine. It's essentially like our BAR, an automatic rifle, because it doesn't, it's not belt-fed. It held 30 rounds where our BAR held 20. But when you're talking about dealing with a weapon with a barrel change capability and a belt fed, uh, that's what made the German squads have so much more power than the others. A lot of people mistakenly say, well, the Germans lost the war because they had a bolt action rifle. That's not true. The bolt action rifles were there to support the machine gun. Unlike any other army, the German machine guns were made, the, the squad supported the machine gun instead of vice versa. So the Germans had tremendous firepower. And then as the war progressed, you see a lot of Germans carrying Russian submachine guns in addition to their rifles. So the British soldiers, you know, you have something called TO&E, Table Organization and Equipment, but in warfare, people very quickly improvise. And of course, when Roy was manning the wall, he was carrying a Bren gun, and they had a real cons concerted attack by the Germans with tanks and infantry, two battalions, and he said the thing that saved them, they were able to call in air, air support. And otherwise, that wall would have probably fallen. But Roy's seen an awful lot of combat, and so has Freddy. They were actually captured in Italy, but escaped that night before they would have been sent back to the prisoner of war camp. Uh, I know you've interviewed Roy once, but you could probably talk to him for three, four, five hours, and the amount of stories he's told me are just, I'm just barely touched on it. And he, of course, his is a lot better because he was there and I wasn't. But they were with number three commando, part of the commandos that landed at Sword Beach with the Brigadier Lord Lovett. And many times when we've driven from Weistrom along the road, Roy and Freddie would say, this is the way we came. Thank you very much, and uh, I appreciate uh, your thoughts and the information that you gave us. So future viewers who look at this and want to look up Fred or Roy, there'll be something here for them to uh, learn from. Fred Walker and Roy Cadman of Number 3 Commando. I'm glad I still have Roy, and I wouldn't trade knowing these men. I knew when I came here in 95 that I would have to watch them one by one pass across the river, but I wouldn't trade these trips for all the money in the world. I'm wealthy because I've been here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Well, let's all square. 
right to Irish Paddy, oh. Saying Mike Maloney wants to marry me, and so leave the strand and pick a billy, or you'll be to blame. For love has fairly drove me silly, hoping you're the same. It's a long way to Tipperary. It's a long way to go. It's a long way to Tipperary, to the sweetest girl I know. Goodbye, Piccadilly. Farewell, Leicester Square. It's a long, long way to Tipperary. The pipes, the pipes are calling From glen to glen And down the mountainside The summer's gone And all the roses falling Tis you, tis you must go and I must bide. But come ye back when summer's in the meadow, or when the And white with snow Tis I'll be there In the sunshine Or in the shadow Oh, Danny boy Oh, Danny boy I love you And when ye come And all of the flowers are dying And I am dead As dead I will may be You'll come and find Where I am lying I kneel and say An ave there for me And I shall hear A soft you tread And on my grave will warmer, sweeter be. And ye shall bend and tell me that you love me. And I shall sleep. In peace until 